The NFL season is right around the corner. And for all 32 teams, hope springs eternal. In large part because of the work that each team commissioned during April's NFL Draft. Can Trevor Lawrence get the Jacksonville Jaguars out of the NFL's version of a basement cellar? And can Zach Wilson finally signal hope and aspirational days ahead for some long-suffering New York Jets fans? And in totality, how will the 2021 NFL Draft Class affect results on the gridiron this fall? Those are just some of the questions that I posed to Kyle Stackpole, an NFL Draft Editor for CBS Sports who joined me this week to answer the fundamental question of how will this draft class affect results on the gridiron this year and beyond. I'm ready to talk some football, so if you have some time, why won't you stay a while? I'm Kevin McShann, let's have this conversation. Take a moment to welcome you to the show, and I'm excited to talk a little football with you tonight. So great to be with you, and thanks so much for being here, buddy. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about the NFL a couple days away. Well, it's like Christmas in September, isn't it? It is. It really is. I can't wait. Absolutely. So, Kyle, let's dive right into it, buddy. I know uh, that you covered the NFL draft for CBS Sports, and I'm curious to begin our conversation by asking you, when you look at the totality of the entire NFL draft, what do you think is the big, biggest impact we'll see on the field as a result of the dr- draft from this past April? Yeah, I think the biggest thing you have to start with the quarterbacks and the guys chosen one, two, three, Trevor Lawrence. And then uh, you, have, you have Trey Lance, you have Justin Fields, you have Zach Wilson, and you, and you have all these different guys. And, and you have Wilson and, and Lawrence are going to start as well as Mac Jones, as we saw with the Patriots releasing Cam Newton. So I think it's going to be all about how those guys are going to perform. A year ago, you thought that Burrow and Tua were going to be the guys that started right away and make a big impact and ended up being Justin Herbert. So I'm excited to see who's going to be that guy this year who really steps up, who separates himself from the other rookies and really gives a boost to a team that who knows if if that quarter quarterbacks plays really well, they could be in playoff contention. So let me uh, give you uh, the crystal ball, bud. Which uh, quarterback do you think will have the most success this season? Ooh, that's tough because I think you would, based on talent, you would say Trevor Lawrence, but the situation around him in Jacksonville isn't ideal at the moment. Uh, you know, new coach, a lot of new pieces, obviously finished 1 15 last year. So I'm going to go with a guy a little under the radar, someone who's not starting this year in Trey Lance, because I think he's set up in the best situation, even though he's going to sit behind Jimmy Garoppolo to start the year. And who knows? I mean, best case scenario for San Francisco, Jimmy Garoppolo plays the best football of his career and Trey Lance never gets on the field. And people would probably laugh at me that I chose him as as the guy who could potentially make the biggest impact, but He's Trey Lance, the guy with so much potential, and he showed a lot in the preseason. And he's really a dual threat quarterback and does something with his legs that Jimmy Garoppolo can't. 
So I envision the 49ers, even if they are playing well, when Lance shows in practice that he's ready to be the guy, I think Shanahan isn't going to hesitate to make him QB1 in San Francisco. And with all the pieces around him, with the that defensive line and linebacking core, and with the coaching staff, Kyle Shanahan knows how to work with QBs and how to get the most out of them. Trey Lance could – I think he's in a perfect situation if he can get on the field. You know, Kyle, I'm a long-suffering Detroit Lions fan, so uh, San Francisco opens in Detroit. So uh, uh, the game should be over by halftime. So Trey Lance may get in in his first game in his rookie season. No, I'm kidding. But that's uh, that. That's another story for another day there, Kyle. There's always a next year as Lions fans, right? Exactly. Although I think, you know, the, the draft class, they have they have some pieces. They, they have a really athletic draft class. And it's just a matter of getting on the field. If, if the Dan Campbell and the coaching staff can coach them up, I think the future can be bright. I mean, you have you have uh, Jared Goff as well. And he he ended poorly in L.A., but he was only he's only a couple years removed from the Super Bowl, a former number one pick. So I think. There's a lot to like about the team, even though it's it's going to be a, a tough go of it this year, perhaps. Well, you know, uh, we've waited this long for a winter here in Detroit, so what's another year right now? Exactly. <laughs> hey, Kyle, I'm, I'm just to ask you about success, success and what that looks like this year uh, for Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I think first and foremost, he has to stay healthy. And I think I – saw today Urban Meyer had a press conference and he was saying how they're not going to look to do much with Lawrence in the running game when they go spread offense and they they, they do not want him getting hurt they don't want him taking hits unnecessary hits he's going to get sacked that's the nature of the NFL but I think the biggest thing for him is going to be staying healthy because the biggest part of being a rookie quarterback and really any player but especially a quarterback with everything involved with the position is getting those game reps. You can't replicate that speed in practice and that game-like atmosphere. So I think for Lawrence, it's going to be first and foremost about staying healthy. If he is able to stay healthy, he's too talented of a quarterback, even if they don't have necessarily the best pieces around him, to make a lot of plays. And, I mean, if you look at Las Vegas, Las Vegas, with the odds, believe that he's the favorite for Rookie of the Year. So he's the number one pick. He's the favorite to win Rookie of the Year. I think success for him would mean staying healthy and winning that rookie of the year and validating his draft pick as the number one guy and and really the number one draft prospect in a decade since Andrew Luck. So I'm expecting big things for Trevor Lawrence. He might undergo some growing pains early on as him and Urban and and just all those new pieces mesh. Um, Although the divisions, you know, doesn't look too bad with the Texans being the Texans the Colts having the Carson Wentz and COVID and injury issues. And the Titans, the Titans look like the clear, the clear number one in that group, but who knows, maybe Ryan Tannehill falls back to what he was when he was in Miami. So I think Trevor Lawrence uh, has a chance to have a really good rookie year. And I think success would be executing and capitalizing on his skill set and his talent and winning rookie of the year, just like Justin Herbert did last year. And now, Kyle, I know that you're currently on the east coast of the country, and I don't have to tell you that uh, the Jets uh, fans have been uh, long-suffering in terms of finding their next answer at quarterback, and I'm sure you saw what Tony Romo had to say about Zach Wilson. So I'm curious if you uh, shared the same sentiment, buddy. Yeah, I I think uh, Zach Wilson, you know, he really – He's a he's a great pick at number two. I like what the Jets were able to do there. And I think he has some guys around him, some wide receivers, Jameson Crowder and Elijah Moore, Corey Davis from Tennessee, that they're going to help him make a lot of plays. And even Michael Carter, the rookie in the backfield out of North Carolina, that offense, it's again, is going to go through some growing pains, just like Jacksonville, because it is a new staff. But I think it looks like he's the guy and I don't think he's afraid of the spotlight. We, I did not think I would be talking about Zach Wilson leading a team in New York last year because he wasn't on anyone's radar, but after a huge season at BYU, he showed that he's worthy of the second pick 
And I think he is going to show that he's worthy of that pick and, and that he can make plays in this league and he can be a starting quarterback in this league. So I think that was a solid pick. I think Jets fans have a lot of reasons to be excited because you're right. They haven't had a bunch of reasons to be excited since you know, Mark, Mark Sanchez led them to AFC championship game somehow. But I, I think he's going to be fun to watch this year and he's going to make a couple eye plopping plays that are going to keep the league on notice. Hey, Kyle, outside of uh, quarterback, tell me which uh, players or position groups or uh, what was outside of quarterback, what are you most excited about, Bob? Yeah, I think I'm most excited about the wide receivers. So everyone was saying how the wide receiver class in 2020 was perhaps the deepest, deepest it's ever been. And then 2021 came along, and all of a sudden, they were the deepest and most talented draft class. And there has been some struggles early. Jamar Chase with the Bengals has been experiencing some drops and, and, you know, he's been struggling there with Joe Burrow, even though they spent the season together, a magical season together in, at LSU. And then you have some injuries going on. Rashad Bateman from the Ravens, he's dealing with an injury. You have a couple other guys that haven't been able to stay on the field as much as maybe you would have liked them to. But I, I mean, I, they're just so talented. I think, Jalen Waddell, Devonta Smith with the Eagles, Jamar Chase. I think they're all going to be solid receivers in this league. Out of those three, I would probably say Devonta Smith would is going to be the most productive. I think Jamar Chase is the most talented, and he might have the highest ceiling. But just with the weapons that they already have there, T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd, the, Joe Mixon, Joe Burrow is going to be able to have the luxury to spread it around. Whereas in Philadelphia, they never have wide receivers, ever. They just – I mean, they had Travis Fulgham, who came out of nowhere last year, and he was great, and he was a great story, and then they cut him. And so they just need a number one guy to step up. And Devonta Smith, he doesn't have the size, and people knocked him for that, but that doesn't matter. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He, he's productive regardless of his physical stature, and he's going to be productive in the NFL – so I'm excited to see what he's able to do in the NFC East and, and beyond this year. Hey, Kyle, I'm also curious to ask you about what the Bengals did in the draft. You know, they went with the wide receiver uh, uh, pairing Burrow up with his former college teammate over drafting uh, the offensive tackle in Sewell who went to Detroit. So I'm just curious to get your thoughts on the thought process of uh, behind that decision yeah I think that's that's definitely a tough decision um personally I would have gone with the offensive line the offensive lineman because Sewell was regarded as one of the safest picks in this draft even if he's been struggling the preseason and Chase the wide receiver is already a position of strength it might be one of the biggest strengths in their team so I didn't really understand adding another top receiver even though you had Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase at LSU when they went undefeated and had the best statistical offensive season in college football history so I, I was skeptical and it's not looking great right now with Chase experienced those jobs but I, I don't know I I think it's gonna bite him honestly um I don't know when and what fashion, but I did know early in training camp that Burrow was having a lot of issues getting the ball off. And this was against the Bengals defense. And we know the Bengals defense isn't really one that other NFL teams are concerned about. So if the Bengals are defense is getting to Burrow, then what's going to happen when you have the Browns defense coming, you have the Steelers, you're going to have the Ravens. I mean, the, the pass rushes in that division are incredible. And so I, I, I was definitely I – would, I would even say you know, flabbergasted that they didn't go offensive lineman. It just seemed like such a clear need, and they deviated from that to get the wide receiver. So, I mean, you can – you're only going to rack up points when Burrow's in there, and for Burrow to be in there, he's got to be protect, protected. So we'll see if the Bengals' offensive line can hold up this year. 
Yeah, uh, especially considering considering how Burrow ended the season, I was a bit surprised that uh, they went uh, with, with the skill position myself. Uh, I, I'm uh, also wondering your thought on, to, on the trend that we're seeing with uh, a teams sort of uh, matching their players up with former college teammates in the draft. So I'm wondering your uh, thoughts there, Bun. Yeah, I, th- I think it's always good to have familiarity, especially between, especially between quarterbacks and wide receivers, because really when you think about two positions that need to mesh and the with two positions that if they are able to mesh, you know, the, the product could be insanely good. I think it's wide receiver and quarterback, but I think it's all situational and it all depends on circumstances. And if you can get, if you have a position of need and it is wide receiver and you ha- and your quarterback went to the same school as him, then great, go pick him up. But if there's a bigger need, I don't think that pairing college teammates is the way to go just be just because they played college together because I mean they, they only really had you know one really good season together but a, the wide receiver you bring in for Cincinnati you're hoping that they're going to have 10 years together you know if you're, you're picking a first round pick so you would think that in a couple of years they would have better, better chemistry than the receiver and the quarterback had in college anyway so I don't I think if it happens, then great. And I think it's an added bonus, but I don't think it should be something that scouting departments and coaches and and players are concerned about, because I think you do probably get a bunch of players who are trying to get into their coaches ears of, Hey, I want this guy. Look at the magic we did here. Let's continue this in the NFL because it's way easier said than done when you're dealing with NFL players and college players. So I, I don't necessarily agree with it. And I don't think it's, at a point where it's it's too much and like too many teams are doing it and it needs to be addressed seriously but i think it should just be a almost a coincidence if it happens rather than a priority um yeah yeah absolutely and, and kyle let's talk a little bit but we've uh, uh spent a lot of uh our time together talking offense so let's talk A little defense, but as you know, uh, the Cowboys have had a high-profile offseason with their appearance on hard knocks and the revamping of their defense. As you know, uh, Dallas has a lot of high-profile offensive players, but they couldn't stop anybody last year. Uh, So I'm wondering uh, uh, your thoughts on whether their defensive makeover will be enough for them to win games this year, Bonnie? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think what they did, I don't think they're going to be that much better this year because they were just so bad last year. But for them to win the games, they don't have to be in the top 10. They don't even have to be average. As long as they're not the last team or you know the second to last team in the NFL and it's not even close, then I think they're going to be able to win games, especially with Dak Prescott back. But I do like what they did. They recognize the problem and unlike Cincinnati they addressed it by drafting six defensive players with their first six picks starting with Micah Parsons who I think is going to be a stud um even if you know his his depiction of hard knocks people are you know they think he's too cocky or this and that I think he's going to be a playmaker in the middle and I think he's going to be a difference maker for that defense um and then the other guys Parsons is the only starter, but a lot of these these other guys are going to play because Dallas's defense was so bad last year and they needed an influx of young talent. So I think they're going to go through some learning curves as well, especially in the secondary. But I think as the season goes on, the offense is always going to be there. But I think if the defense down the stretch, they can get some more stops. That's going to be the difference between Dallas winning the division and disappointing once again. Absolutely. And tell me, uh, defensively, what are some uh, prospects in this draft that you're ex- ex- excited to see play this year, Bunny? Yeah, so I'm going to start with a guy, and this is a little bit of a cop-out cop because I spent the last two years working with the Washington football team. But I'm going to go with uh, Jamin Davis, linebacker from Kentucky. Washington picked him 19th overall. And he's a guy that 
really flew under the radar. He wasn't a full-time starter at Kentucky until last year, but he burst up the draft boards. His athleticism is, is incredible. His physical, his physical tools. And he's going to be the starter in the middle for Washington, who, as you know, has one of the best defensive lines in football. They were, I think the number two defense when it came to points allowed last year and top five when it came to yards allowed. And while everyone is talking about that, that defensive line, the linebackers really struggled last year. And I think if by adding Jamin Davis to the mix and allowing him to play behind that defensive line, he's going to be able to make a lot of plays. And he's, he's a guy who he's not the favorite for rookie of the year, but I think he might be third and he's definitely could be a choice. Uh, in the middle and he could be that missing piece that Washington needs to really be a lockdown defense because the secondary is pretty good too with Kendall Fuller, Landon Collins and the addition of William Jackson, the third in the off season. So I'm definitely excited to watch him play uh, first and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. And which uh, team do you think has to get the most out of their draft class in order to have a successful season this year, bud? Yeah. So initially I was thinking maybe I'll go with, Buffalo, because Buffalo last year, they had everything except for the edge rushers. And so they spent their first two picks on edge rushers. But then I, I looked at their depth chart and I dug into it a little bit more and they're, they're not really going to be the pieces that help get Buffalo over the top. So looked a little more into it. And this is an obvious one. I should have picked this from the start. It's got to be the Pittsburgh Steelers. Their first four picks they're actually the, the team that's playing Buffalo. So I guess I was on the right track somewhere. But Steelers, first four picks, you have Najee Harris, obviously going to be the running back one. Big things are expected from him. You have Pat Fryer moved the tight end from Penn State, who made a couple of great plays in the preseason. You have Kendrick Green, who's a guard. He's going to be starting. And then you have Dan Moore, a tackle, and he's also going to be starting. So you're talking about four, your first four picks starting in week one. And – the Steelers lost, I think, four starters on the offensive line, and but they still have pieces. Their wire, they might have the best wide receiving trio in the NFL. Big Ben is 39 years old, and he's coming off a, a season in which he, one of his, you know, not his fondest seasons, uh, and and obviously the Steelers at a whole uh, after starting so hot uh, and faltering down the stretch, but the really for them to be a playoff team again and for them to try to go far they need to have a running back they need to have a balanced offense because they just did not have a balanced offense last year and they need to give big ben some time in the pocket because he was getting the ball out in, in one or two seconds last year because he didn't want to get sacked and that was when they had their off like their proven offensive line guys so if these rookies don't make a name for themselves early and if Najee harris can't find holes and if these offensive linemen can't hold hold their blocks. It's going to be tough for Pittsburgh to not even get to the playoffs, but even have a winning record in this division. Well, yeah, they're in a, a difficult division, and I think you'll get multiple teams out of that division for sure. And uh, Kyle, I'm curious to ask you about uh, Detroit Lions football, not only because I'm a Lions fan, but I uh, I live in Windsor, which is the city right across the river from Detroit. So tell me, how do you think the Lions draft class will impact this upcoming season and beyond? And, and what do you think about of the direction uh, that Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes are trying to build the team? Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, I love I love Dan Campbell. I love I love his passion, uh, his, his press conferences, just his sayings there. And it comes off. He's like a football guy, true and true. But I think behind those sayings, behind we're going to hit him in the kneecap, there are real philosophies that he's going to be able to instill in his players. And I think his players are going to respond to that. So I like what they've done with Dan Campbell. In terms of the front office and the draft, I, I think they did a solid job. Like I said, they really went after very athletic draft picks and players that if they can develop and they can mold into their type of players and their scheme – this, the ceiling is really high for this group. And we, we talked a little bit about Penny Sewell and how he struggled, but they don't think that's going to be an issue. I don't think that's going to be an issue. He was one of the safest picks in the draft. I think he's going to be a pro, pro Bowl caliber guy, and you pair him with Frank Ragnow, and those two guys you know, are going to help Detroit if they can get a couple more offensive linemen. 
And then you're talking about one of the more formidable offensive lines in this league. So, and you already have the quarterback in Jared Goff. So, and, and DeAndre Swift as well. So they do have some young pieces, some established pieces. I think what they did at wide receiver with, uh, what's his name? Amon Ross St. Brown uh, from round four. He's been making some plays in training camp. And I think he's going to have a lot of opportunities to step up with the Lions receiving core, not being as deep and as talented as a, uh, a lot of others around the league. But yeah, I, I think it's going to take some time. It's, it's a rebuild. They admitted that they cleaned house and they got rid of Matthew Stafford, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And I think the steps they're taking to get back and, and, you know, try to make the playoffs and try to become a contender are the correct ones. And I'm, I am excited to see what Dan Campbell is able to do. And I'll definitely be following along even as a casual I wouldn't even, I mean, I'm not a Lions fan, but even as just an NFL guy, even if the Lions aren't doing well, I will still be following Dan Campbell just because I like what he brings to the table. You want to bite up, bite off some kneecaps, do you, Kyle? Yeah, I'm, I'm into it. I mean, that, that first press conference, I, I couldn't get enough of it. I think I listened to it a couple of times and, and he just, he's just like the gift that keeps on giving and he, and he's honest, which I love. He's honest with the, with the press core, which a lot of coaches, I mean, Bill Belichick, they're all coach speak and they don't give you anything. He speaks his mind. And even if he might get ridiculed for it in the media, he speaks what he thinks. And I think that type of transparency and communication is going to help build connections with his players and the rest of his coaching staff. Well, Kyle, I can't get much worse than Matt Patricia, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the other thing I probably should have mentioned. It can only go up from there. And so I think, I think Dan has what it takes to take this, franchise to where you know it deserves to be which is black and back in the playoff continue well you know uh i've been a lion fan all my life and i haven't won anything since i've been alive so hope springs eternal with the lions right so anyway Kyle, i'm also uh, curious to ask you about under the radar players that people people may not be paying much attention to that may have a big impact this season but yeah, so I think this is a guy who a couple weeks ago a lot more people might have been talking about, but and I mentioned him earlier, is Rashad Bateman, the receiver for the Ravens, 27th pick. So while the other receivers, Jalen Waddle, Devonta Smith, Jamar Chase, while they introduce themselves to the NFL, they're going to probably make some fantastic catches that are going to be all over social media, and all you're going to have all your fantasy football guys going to the waiver wire trying to pick them up. But I think, and he'll be out. So while that's happening, Rashad Bateman will be out. He, suff he suffered an injury. He's going to be out a couple of weeks. But I think he's a guy that he's going to come back and he could immediately be the number one receiver in that offense and the number two pass catcher behind tight end Mark Andrews. Because the Ravens, they've been so close. They're such a dominant running team. They have such a good defense. Lamar is unbelievable but they just haven't had that wide receiver to really stretch the defense. And they thought that would be Marquise Brown. He hasn't been that guy. The Ravens have really just struggled to hit on wide receivers. And if, if they just hit on one of them, they, you would think that, you know, they would have made a Super Bowl by now. So I think Bateman's going to come back from injury. He's a guy with ideal size, ideal speed to be an outside target. He's got pro ready hands. He's a good route runner. And if, if he, I think he's going to recognize the opportunity to step up and I think him and Marquise Brown as well are going to push each other. And I think if Marquise Brown could make a name for himself in year three and, and really take a jump because he ended last year pretty well, then that Bateman could be the missing piece that the Ravens need, uh, even without J.K. Dobbins, to make a run not only for the AFC North, but the entire AFC and try to upend the Kansas City Chiefs. And Kyle, my final question for you, Bobby, is – when we look into a, a next year's draft, how uh, do, you, do you think uh, that'll shake out in terms of players to watch or just how do you think uh, uh, this college football season may affect a next year's draft as well? Yeah, I, I definitely think that the quarterbacks aren't as highly touted. You don't have a Trevor Lawrence, um, but you, I mean, you look at a couple of years ago, no one thought Joe Burrow was going to be number one. People, I don't even know where people had Joe Burrow drafted. Day three, maybe not drafted at all. 
And so I think Spencer Rattler from Oklahoma, he's a name to watch. He's, he could be potentially the number one pick in the draft. People thought that Sam Howell from North Carolina, he could be potentially the number one pick in the draft. He didn't look great in their first game against Virginia Tech, who knocked off North Carolina. Uh, Carson Strong from Nevada, he could be a name to watch. He could be someone that, similar to Zach Wilson, is in a lesser conference, doesn't get as much publicity and notoriety, but the skill set is there. And I think he also has a chance to make a leap into that top 10 and, and really – and it only takes one team to fall in love with you. I mean, QB needy teams, if they feel like you're the guy, they're going to they're gonna take you. So I think the quarterbacks aren't as good. Um, I am excited to watch uh, Kayvon, I think I said that name right, uh, Thibodeau out of Oregon. He's he's a stud off the edge. He's He actually is our number one draft prospect for 2022 at the moment. I think it's, I think it's pretty consensus about uh, among our three writers. So he, he's a he's a really strong guy, and I'm excited to see him play against Ohio State this weekend if he's able to go. I know he got a little bit of an injury, but yeah, it's the interesting thing about the draft every year, especially just starting out the college season, is you have the guys who you know are going to be good and know are going to be top ten picks, but then you have guys who are just going to come out of nowhere, and guys who you haven't even thought about that are going to be locked into the first round and that are going to make college football so fun to watch. So I'm excited to watch week by week and see how these prospects develop and how they make a name for themselves or, or maybe falter and, and move down draft boards. But it's, it's going to be exciting to see how it all unfolds. And I'm excited to you know help out the coverage at CBS sports as the season gets going. And, and then after the year where, where my work really gets started with the draft and, seeing where these prospects end up and, and who decides to draft them and, and how they continue their NFL career. So it should be exciting. There's, there's so much going on this time of year. College football already started, NFL in a couple of days. It's going to be packed from now until the Super Bowl in February. So I'm really excited. Well, that, that's why I'm so a great – Grateful you found a few minutes to talk to me tonight, buddy. It's most appreciated. And tell me, how come you people find your uh, stuff? Because I know you just got promoted at CBS Sports. So c- congratulations on becoming their new uh, draft editor. And tell me, how, how can people find your stuff, bud? Definitely. So you can follow me on Twitter, at uh, Kyle F. Stackpole. And then the work will just be on cbssports.com and then you'll be able to go to the NFL and then there'll be an NFL draft tab. So as it works right now, I'll be doing about half NFL stuff, half NFL draft stuff. So we won't have as much NFL draft coverage during the season, but we will still have weekly mock drafts from our writers like Ryan Wilson and Josh Edwards. And then once the new year starts, it's really going to ramp up, but so we'll still have, we'll still have some draft content to, you know, really whet the appetite as the NFL season's going. And then as the season dwindles down and teams, you start recognizing teams that are going to be in the top five, we're going to be in the top 10. Then we're really going to ratchet it up and, and make sure those fan bases have articles to read. And, and, and really, really with the draft, I found it's all about, it's all about hope. And it's a, fans hoping that this player could be the player that takes them from, the playoffs to the Super Bowl or from the bottom of the division to a playoff contender or a playoff contender to a perennial playoff contender. So I think that's why the NFL's draft is so great and why so many people follow along. So I'm just happy to be able to help with CBS sports coverage. They got a, a great group over there and I'm really trying to get as much co- uh, content about as many prospects to as many people that want to read it. So definitely excited for the season and the upcoming draft next in April. Fantastic, Kyle. You know, everybody loves a mock draft, right, Kyle? Exactly. So if you're ever struggling for content, you can always pull out the mock draft card, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And people cannot get enough. It's, uh, it's, it's actually crazy, but you know what? If people people keep reading them, we're going to keep putting them out. Absolutely. And uh, I always enjoyed talking football, and I enjoyed uh, spending some time with you. So I want to... Uh, Thank you for appearing on the show. I'm better for talking to you, and I want to thank you for your time, energy, and efforts on my behalf. It's most appreciated. Thanks so much, Kevin. Really appreciate it. And 
you have have fun watching football this year and good luck to the Detroit Lions. Hopefully Dan Campbell can break some kneecaps on the way to, you know, potentially trying to fight for a playoff spot. Who knows? It's the NFL. So anything can happen. Uh, probably not in his first year, but I, <laughs> I like where your head's at. But thanks for the time, buddy. It's most appreciated. Of course. Have a great one and enjoy the season.